Hello, and welcome back to another episode of Critical Reactions with your host, Brian. We're going to continue on with this week's theme of groove, checking out songs that are groovy, I suppose would be a way to go about saying that. Today, we're going to be looking at a very popular band, Led Zeppelin. The track is When the Levee Breaks. The title is familiar, but... I can't really place a sound to it, so we'll find out <laughs> diving into this one if I've actually heard it before or not. All right, let's see what Led Zeppelin is bringing to the table today. Yeah, so right here, a lot of the grooves coming from the syncopated bass kicks on 3 and 4. Or I should say, I think it's the second bar. 1 and 2 are the second bar. Really interesting soundscape and atmosphere being created by this left hand uh, guitar. Harmonica, actually. That was interesting. There was a symbol that was right pans, like heavy right pan, very prominent above the guitar as well. A little bit of clipping there on that vocal line. It's a very interesting way to write a song. It, it's like standard song structure combined with psychedelia's linearity and repetition. Which seems opposite, but uh, I hope that I'll, I'll talk about that later. Yes, yeah, so we got that eighth note with the dotted quarter. That really disjointed rhythm right there. Sound of a levy 
the whole production on this is just, it's very interesting to me. It's very different from modern production uh, and where instruments tend to get placed. There's also interesting fluctuations of volume. Wild panning there with that left guitar uh, going center and then left and back and forth there rather than across. <laughs> what? Well, I can honestly say I have not heard that song before. I don't know why the title sounds familiar. That was... Uh, there's just a lot of interesting things going on in there that I would not expect. It's a, it's a strange combination of things, and I don't really know where to start. Um, I really hope by the end of this I have some positive things to say because it's not a bad track at all. Uh, but there are a lot of things that stick out to me as odd choices. And it could have just been for the times. I'm, uh, I know Led Zeppelin's an older band. Um, and of course I don't have information here, but it looks like it was at least pre-80s. Uh, somewhere, somewhere in the 70s, it looks like, is when this came out, which kind of lines up with some of my, uh, my guess would be somewhere in the 70s, based entirely on the production of it, but um, I, I guess we're going to start with the production, and then we'll get into some musical things after that. Um, so, where to begin? Um... Let's start with the vocals, all right? I didn't really hear too many issues up until maybe the halfway point through the song, and I really noticed that we had more sections where the vocals were extremely dominant in the sound sphere, whether they were isolated, uh, maybe there were other instruments that weren't as loud as them, or maybe it was more of a, a, a quieter section. Um, with, with less instrumentation in it. But for whatever reason, the vocals could be heard very clearly. And there is a constant effect being put on them that is probably just from the creation of the song at the time. Um, it probably would have been done on tape, I believe. If I'm remembering correctly, if my info is correct. Um, and so there's going to be some... 
I guess, auditory discrepancies based on some of the older equipment uh, that they were recording with at the time. Uh, on top of, you know, who knows where this track came from. And it's also, it looks like it's also possibly a 2012 remaster. So, uh, who knows what the remaster did as well. But at least what I'm hearing, first of all, there's a lot of top end being cut off. And that is due to clipping. It happens during a lot of the louder sections when he's kind of screaming, I guess. This is, this is, he's screaming, right? He's, he's using a mixed chest and head voice and really belting it out. And it sounds like he's actually clipping on the microphone, which is going to erase some of the, 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 the top end of the, the sound, uh, remove some of the sound quality of that, that timbre and replace it with some, a little bit of crackling. It's not a lot of clipping. It's not like he's going way over, but it's definitely not a full sound. There's also a bit of a warble uh, at times, especially, like I said, I think it was in the middle. It was very dominant there because the vocalist was almost isolated. There wasn't really much going on else around it. I don't know if it was actually just pure vocals. Maybe it was vocals in the harmonica or something. But it was just very clear. This was the, the best time that you can listen to just the vocals and hear exactly what's going on there. And yeah, there's a lot of oddities in it. There's that clipping, there's a, a warbleness to it, and like I said, some of it I think is just the production of the time, right? The the materials and hardware that, that they had available to them to record this music, and some of it's just going to be that, it could be that this is a remaster, and whatever uh, original they were utilizing to create this had uh you know degraded over time or something you know i don't know what exactly led to it but it's something that stood out to me and i couldn't unhear once i did um another thing is just the placement of things it's uh, you know i mentioned it's very different from a modern production and what i mean by that is every era and genre have their own production techniques kind of the standardization of what the genre should, should sound like. Uh, you know, lo-fi black metal doesn't sound like pop, but if you look at a lot of lo-fi black metal songs, you're going to hear similar ideas in them. Uh, how effects should be utilized, how distortion should be utilized, how distorted things should be, um, you know, where instruments should be placed. There's, there's a lot of standardization that has happened over years of genres existing that a lot of people tend to utilize because they work you know standards become standards because people copy them all right they sounded good so i changed the formula and so when you look at 70s rock compared to 2020s rock or metal or pop or anything modern there's going to be some differences in how uh instruments are placed and that's one thing that I, I could not get over here. And it's really interesting. I mean, it is, this isn't just for Led Zeppelin. This is something I've talked about with a lot of older bands. And it really just continues to astound me the differences in production techniques that, that has gone into music across the decades. So when I'm listening to this song, I'm really listening to where things are placed. And it does have sort of a standard idea of guitars, or the two lead instruments. Not always guitars. Sometimes guitars, sometimes a harmonica, pan left and right, with our vocals and drums center panned. And that is kind of standard. Uh, I'm interested if this is how it was done originally, uh, or if this was done for the remaster to bring it up to modern production standards. However, what, what interested me most was not necessarily the general area that they were, but kind of where they're placed within this general area and how they move. The drums are centered, and they do have a bit of panning as you go across the drums, so the hi-hat and the lowest tom are going to have different pannings. <coughs> but it's to me it's the width of it uh you know at the very beginning i mentioned a symbol that was just so far right panned and so high in volume that it overshadowed the guitar that called the right side its home that was the only thing over there and occasionally this hi-hat or symbol would it would show up 
but it came in and just dominated the side. It was very interesting. I think it actually might have been, now that I think about it, the hi-hat and snare together. And for whatever reason, it just had this volume peak. And that's something we're going to touch on in a bit too, because I even mentioned that, that there's uh, volume changes all throughout this. And it's another thing that interests me because I, it's just a strange imperfection, or at least what I perceive to be an imperfection. Um, and then at the end of the song, you know, we have this, uh, no, it was the middle of the song when we had the left guitar moving between pan left and center. That was interesting because usually when we hear um, cross panning, it's from one side to the other. And that's something we've heard not only just in modern music, but also in a lot of 70s prog stuff. Uh, yes, uh, I guess we're just going to stick with yes right now. Cause, oh, Coliseum, I think, was another one, another group that uh, made heavy use of that. Um, and there's been there's been a few others that we've checked out. It's something just about the 70s, you know, the new tech involved. Uh, stereo production, I think, was coming out around this time, or maybe it was becoming big around this time. Uh, maybe the 60s was when it came out, but 70s seems to be when it was getting big, and people were really beginning to push the boundaries of what you can do with music, you know? And playing around with panning and spatial orientation was, you know, something to be uh, probably labeled as experimentation. You know, we, we talk about experimental metal and experimental rock or stuff like that, and usually we're talking about combining things, but back then, I mean, experimental rock would have just been playing around with new production tech, which, you know, you can hear that here. We, we have this panning and we don't have anything standardized yet. You know, what happens if we just pan center to left? I think it sounds weird. <laughs> I really do. But at the time, maybe, you know, people didn't have ears for it and they thought it was this phenomenal effect. So I, I do kind of want that to color this entire section. You know, I'm talking about the production of it, but I am talking about it retrospectively as somebody who is primarily uh, engaged with modern production. I don't really have the, the context to correctly gauge, you know, what was going on here other than just to compare it with modern times, which is not a great way to go about it, but it's the best tool I have. Um, so I, I'm doing my best not to say that it's it's bad or, or weird, but just that it's different than what I'm used to and that it possibly could have been really interesting at the time. Uh, what was the other thing, though? Oh, yeah, and then the volume, right? So we there's there's this section that is very predominant in the chorus, and it's that uh, eighth note into the dotted quarter note, the da-da, 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 that idea right there. So I think it was the second or third time through the course, definitely not the first. The first repetition of this, though, the first two times they do that pattern, it is at max maximum volume. So on my visualizer, it's going to be at negative 10. But the next two times it comes in, it's at negative like 13, negative 15, somewhere in there. It's a little quieter than it was, but it's the same section. It's the same intensity of attack. It doesn't feel like they're strumming lighter. It literally feels like <laughs> on beat four, while they're holding out that dotted quarter, they went over to the amp, turned the volume down a little bit, and then continued playing. It just, it sounds abnormal. And it happens all throughout this song. There is plenty of times where I actually thought my hearing was going because the song seemed, seemingly was going just along its way and out of nowhere there'd be a, a small volume drop. And then at the beginning of the next section, the volume would go back up to where it should be. And it, it's, it's weird how the it dropped randomly but always came back at a, at a section. Uh, which makes me think that it was a production idea. I'm not sure. Maybe there were volume inconsistencies while recording it, and the producer did their best to ensure that it maintained that full volume most of the time. You know, you know, we'll check what the volume's at at the beginning of the next verse or the next chorus or whatever. But it's like I said, it's it's. I don't want to label it as an imperfection. It could very well have been entirely intentional, and it also could have been part of this 2012 remaster. I don't want to place the blame anywhere because I honestly don't know why it's there. 
but it is something that stood out to me a lot and it happened constantly throughout the track and it it much like the other production aspects I'm talking about it distracted from my ability to get into and enjoy the song you'll notice probably at the beginning of the track I was grooving along with it I was getting real big into that nice groove that the drum uh, the drum and bass were laying down and halfway through the song I think I stopped the I think I even stopped nodding my head and I was getting more intent into the music because it kept drawing attention to itself I couldn't not listen to some of these oddities showing up so, yeah, I don't want that to be a negative, though. Like I said, I don't know the the intentions behind it. It could have been accidental. It could have been something to do with the remaster. Maybe, maybe whoever uh, mastered it again messed it up. Maybe it was completely intentional, and they absolutely love the way that sounds, and it was just part of that experimental nature of new technology. I don't know. What I do know is that it's distracting for me as somebody listening to it you know, uh, 50 years after it came out. Now, the structure is also something that I found a bit interesting. I mentioned that it had a more traditional song structure. I could feel a verse, chorus, verse, chorus kind of concept just in what's going on lyrically. There seems to be a bouncing back and forth between those two ideas. However, musically, it seems to follow more of the psychedelia's what I called linear repetition. Which is to say that the song doesn't have, or doesn't feel like it has any larger cycles going on. It just has more of this linearity of staying within uh, these riffs. And I think a lot of that comes from the right pan guitar that really doesn't change much throughout the song. It has that one riff that it kind of holds down for a lot of the song, and then there's a slight variation on it for the chorus. There is a large change up somewhere in the middle, something that I might call a bridge, but it's not a drastic change. It is the biggest change that the right guitar sees, but again, it kind of is more of a variation of what we already heard, which is kind of that groovy syncopated uh, chord vamping. Oh man, I forgot to talk about, real quick though, um, going back to the production, that ending was kind of bonkers, because we had the harmonica, I think, in the left, and we had this right guitar doing what it's been doing almost all song, doing this flip-flopping, and it's, uh, you know, like I said, at the time, probably was extremely experimental, uh, and people might have enjoyed it for its experimentation or might have not enjoyed it because it was not mono. Like I said, I don't have a context for the time period. But me, a 2022 listener, it is extremely disorienting. That is the type of production I would expect to hear for a song that is trying to seem like it's lost or trying to invoke a sort of feeling of disorientation in the listener. Um, and yeah, I just wanted to point that out just in case the lyrics do kind of dive into some of these themes of, uh, being lost or being confused because I do, I, I want to put that down just in case we see, you know, Hey, I kind of foreshadowed upon this when I was talking about the production, but I also kind of get the feeling that it was just them being experimental with the tech that they had at the time. And panning was a huge thing to play around with, especially in more prog gear bands. I don't know where Led Zeppelin kind of lands on genre. To me, this just kind of feels like classic rock. Uh, but the guitar, moving back into some of the musicality here, the guitar kind of has that psychedelia edge to it based on its tone, its timbre, and the extreme repetition in it to me it just kind of comes off as something that is um just kind of fit uh, uh, maybe psychedelia is not the right word for it it's an interesting riff though in that it's cyclic it just continues to loop upon itself while everything else around it is changing the harmonica at least for my ears didn't have riffs it didn't have loops it continued to play new ideas. 
The vocals did have a bit of a melody that they followed, but also the lyrics were changing. I also think that um, the chorus might have been the same, but the verse, I think, had different melody lines. for. Or maybe it was just different ranges. Maybe one time he was uh, in one octave and the next time he rose it up an octave to increase the intensity. I, I don't know, because the song is... Like I said, it's in that weird area for me where if I view it from one angle, I can feel sort of a, a more traditional song structure as far as pop goes. But if I view it from a different angle, it sort of just stays in one idea for the entirety of the song and doesn't go anywhere. And I'm not really sure what the structure is because of that. Or it could be that different instruments are in different structures, which would be interesting. I don't think I've talked at all about a song that might be polystructural. That's the word I just made up. I'm probably sure I'm not, I, I doubt I'm coining it right now, but it is a really interesting thing that's got my brain going. What if I wrote a song or what if a song was written with multiple structures in it where maybe the vocals follow a verse chorus, verse chorus, bridge chorus idea, something more traditionally pop, but the instruments under it do something completely linear, A, B, C, D, E. Yeah, that'd be F, because that'd have to be six sections to follow with the vocals. Um, and then maybe the bass does an A, A, B, B, A, A idea. Oh, man, this is, this has got my brain turning. <laughs> I'm going to try to keep, keep my attention here, but right now all I want to do is end the video and, and open up uh, you know, muse score and uh, start putting some music down, see what happens. Um, but yeah, so so I'm not sure if it is a polystructural song, but it does have elements of both to it. And I'm not sure where one ends and another begins, and it makes it really difficult for me to understand the structure of the song. And I think the the main root of this is just that there is... A looping element to it. Like I said, the right guitar barely does anything different. There is going to be some variations on the idea, but that's what they are, the variations. The core foundational element of the riff is present throughout the entire song. Same goes for the vibe, the atmosphere. Uh, the way that the song feels doesn't, or yeah, the way that the song feels doesn't really change over the course of the song. There are very few sections that break that atmosphere, that break that emotion that they're going for. Um, oh, another thing that does break it up, though, is the drums. There are quite a few drum sections, uh, drum patterns throughout this track. So that would be another one that kind of lines up more um, structurally uh, along with the harmonica, whereas the vocals... Vocals are just kind of all over the place. I don't even know what the vocals are doing structurally. There's just... I. This is a song that I think is... What's the word? Uh, surprisingly deep? I don't know if surprising is the right word. Like, oh, oh man, a 70s rock song actually has depth. But it on the surface, it feels like uh, one type of song, but the more I think about it, and I'm sure the more times that I listen to it, the more secrets are going to be uncovered, and the more I'm going to realize how deep or varied the song actually is, and I think that's where part of my confusion is coming from, is that I got a surface plus a little bit more of a read, so I have the simplicity of the surface, but I also see the hints of the depth, and I'm trying to parse that, still missing the rest of the iceberg. <laughs> Like, I see the tip, I know there's more under, but I haven't really had a chance to look at what the more is. So I, I have this conflicting idea of just a little bit, and then the knowledge of the, you know, what's underneath the water, but I don't know what it is, I just know it's there. Um, so I guess we're going to get into the lyrics now and see what's going on here. I didn't pick up anything other than somewhere in the six minute mark, he said, when the levee breaks. And I was like, hey, it's the title. But other than that, I didn't pick up much. So I'm going to look into the lyrics and see what I can find. Huh. So there's actually a lot of short verses and short choruses in here. In fact, the song structure, according to this lyrical breakdown, is A, B, A, B, C, D, 
A B A E F. Um, <laughs> uh, and I think that's going to be part of where my confusion came from is that there is this verse chorus verse chorus idea that happens throughout, but the cycle seems to also be a doubling up of the idea of a verse chorus verse chorus bridge. We see that concept twice, but then there's also an instrumental break uh, that goes between this. So we have verse chorus verse chorus bridge instrumental break verse chorus verse chorus bridge outro. Uh, so there is a larger idea of a loop on, on a larger level. We have this A B A B C concept that's repeated twice, right? But then we also have the micro repetition of the verse, chorus, verse, chorus. And these verses and choruses are short, which means that instead of uh, possibly utilizing longer sections, so maybe, you know, 16, 24 bar phrases, something like that, these are probably going to be in the 8 to 12 bar phrase, which means that they're not going to feel as repetitious. Uh, assuming based on the verse length, like the first verse is two sentences. If it keeps on raining, the levee's going to break. If it keeps on raining, the levee's going to break. Now we're done with the verse. Like that is a very short amount of time to be in a verse. And then it goes to the chorus and the chorus is a single sentence. When the levee breaks, have no place to stay. Um, so by having these really short verses, the repetitions are going to be less noticeable which is going to make it feel more linear despite having this this uh, looping structure to it. And then the looping structure happens on both a micro and a macro level, which again is going to introduce some more elements of what feels more linear because the repetitions are both going to be too small to recognize and too large to recognize. Uh, it never really sits in that, that middle point where you can feel the differences. And the fact that the guitar is going to be playing something very similar throughout a lot of this song uh, is going to make it feel very similar throughout, which is going to give it that linearity and that, uh, that massive looping feel. But the fact that there are changes going on is going to make it feel also uh, like it's constantly moving in one direction, never really staying in one place. And it's, it's this great push and pull. The song never really feels like it's going anywhere, but it is always on the move. And that's a very confusing way to go about structuring a track. Especially, it's not even just the structure too, because it's, it's the musicality of it. The structure itself is already not bringing a lot of attention to some of its elements, but the guitar is bringing attention to elements that are in direct opposition to what <laughs> the structure is doing. So we have that confusing element. And then we also have the production at the end with the double panning that at least to a modern listener, is going to induce elements of uh, confusion into the music. And we have a song that is just going to have a very confused, disorienting feel to it throughout. And it explains a lot of uh, my initial reaction, my the, you know, the way that I've interpreted the song so far. What's also interesting is that none of these elements seem to be in line with the lyrics at all. I could probably grasp at straws and extrapolate and kind of pull some of these concepts into the lyrics, but the lyrics are about uh, a flooding, it looks like. Uh, a levee is a, is a uh, it's, it's like a wall to make sure that floods don't happen, so, something like that. Um, and it says if it keeps on raining, the levee's going to break, and when the levee breaks, we'll have no place to stay. You know, the water will come over and flood. And that's what it's about. Somebody who doesn't want to leave his home due to a flooding. Uh, talking about not really wanting to go north or south from where they're at. So, you know, like I said, just really wanting to stay where they are. Uh, says crying and praying won't, won't help you. When the levee breaks, though, you got to move. Uh... <laughs> I guess is uh, the outro says going north, going north to Chicago. Uh, maybe not. The outro is going. I'm going to Chicago. Going to Chicago. Chicago. Sorry, I can't take you. Going down. Going down. Now, just constantly going down. Uh, just repeating this going down. So it sounds like 
going to Chicago, that was their, their concept of north. They had said, if I go down south, they have no work for me. But if I go up north, I'm going to Chicago. Um, and then Inaltro says, I'm going to Chicago. And then, late, and then just two uh, sentences later says, I'm going down. Down would imply south. Uh, I don't know. There is, uh, I guess, sort of an element of confusion. Uh, they don't know where they're going. They're kind of lost now that their house is destroyed from the flood. But, like I said, the confusion doesn't seem to be the primary element here. It seems to be uh, the terror or the fear, possibly, at the beginning would be the fear of this levee breaking. Uh, and not knowing, uh, not knowing what to do, though. The uncertainty of it. That is disorienting. Ah, man. All right, I said it was grasping at straws, extrapolating a bit. I don't think so. I think the disorienting nature in the music is intentional to uh, create the feeling that this person would be having, both before the levee breaks when they can kind of... There was one part where it says, uh, last night I sat on the levee... Uh, oh, I, th I thought he said I heard the levee uh, moan, like it was uh, getting ready to, to break... But that's not what he said at all. So, uh, yeah, I'm gonna gonna cross over that one then. Uh, but yeah, so it's this uncertainty of you know, is the levee going to break? It's it's continuing to rain. Uh, it's it's possible that we're going to have this flood. What's going to happen? I don't know. I don't want to go anywhere. Going south isn't an option. Going north, I mean, I guess that's kind of okay, but it's not what I want to do. And at the end, he seems to not have an option. Maybe ch choosing to go to Chicago, but somebody says they can't take them. Or maybe they can't take somebody who's close to them. Uh, and now they're going down. Like, I'm not, I'm not really sure, but there's definitely elements of contrasting decisions, the uncertainty of what's going to happen in the future. And some of that can feel confusing. Right. Even though that they know it's it's leading up to it, that, uh, you know, it definitely looks like we're going to have a flood. You know, maybe it won't. Maybe we'll be safe. But, you know, if we're not, what's going to happen? And that uncertainty shines through through the music entirely, at least for me. Um, there's just a lot of elements that induce confusion or uncertainty or instability in the production and in the song structure and in the way that the music contrasts with the song structure that I think really ties the emotional elements of being this person uh, on this river knowing that a flood's coming not knowing what your future is going to be like what they're feeling and injecting that into the music um so yeah I, yeah yeah, I'm glad. I'm glad. I came away with something positive out of this. Like I said, I started real, real negative with the production, um, and actually the musicality part and the structure. I, I don't think I was too positive about either. But I've turned this around, and you know, hearing the lyrics here or seeing the lyrics here, I really think the song comes together in a fantastic way. There's still some oddities in it that I'm just going to attribute it to it being an older track. But yeah, overall, this is this is a really well done. Uh, song that finds a, a fantastic way of injecting the emotional element of its main character, possibly the narrator, into the music itself and putting their mindset in the music and allowing the listener to feel and imagine themselves in that position. I think it's it's done very well. But like I said earlier, I'm sure I've only scratched the surface. There's probably a lot going on in here. I didn't pick up on a first time listen. This is where you guys come in. Hit me up in the comments. Let me know what you enjoyed about this one. Let me know if there's anything that stood out to you or if you know of any interviews with Led Zeppelin uh, about you know what this song means, why they made some decisions about it, anything like that. Or if you have your own interpretation yourself. Maybe you've heard the song a dozen times. You have a lot more experience with it or possibly the context. You were born um, early enough to have heard this when it came out and possibly understood it. Let me know in the comments. Above the comment section, there's a description box, and in there is a link for Linktree. It'll take you to this menu right here. You can follow me on Twitter, join the Discord community, support me through Patreon, pick up some merch, check out what I've been listening to. There's just a bunch of stuff in there. Go ahead and check it out. Above the description box, if you could, like, subscribe, and ring the bell. 
We have one more video that came out 10 minutes ago. It's our special selection for today. Much like yesterday, we're checking out another cardiac song that is supposed to be a bit more on the restrained side. So I'm looking forward to that, and hopefully you are too. Until next time, remember to be critical, not cynical, of the music you listen to, and have a fantastic morning, afternoon, or evening whenever you choose to watch my videos.